MediStand Understanding Medicine I am Professor Azizur Rahman and after having a lecture on very basic concepts of CT scan and MRI especially for internists uh, I'm going to talk about the role of CT scan and MRI in the diagnosis of acute stroke. As you all know, CT scan and MRI, they have wide application on all parts of the body. Many uh, diagnoses are actually not possible without these tests, but its greatest application is perhaps in the brain because brain is otherwise difficult to visualize. In fact, when CT scan came in, its first diagnosis, its first application was on the brain. And, uh, and the stroke is, since stroke is a relatively common brain condition, and a quick decision making may be very important uh, because that can uh, open up some option, treatment options, so I think uh, out of uh, many brain condition, uh, CT scan and MRI have greatest application on the diagnosis of acute stroke. Uh, I'm going to show you different images uh, and I will also show you, dis the, the discuss them in some detail. So I hope after attending this lecture, you are able to identify uh, common types of brain strokes uh, like ischemic stroke, uh, hemorrhagic stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, these things you are able to diagnose because uh, uh, diagnosis is very important and a fast diagnosis is very important when you are dealing with acute stroke. So let's start with the module. This is the CT scan of somebody who developed uh, a right sided hemiplegia. Now, this is the scan which was done immediately after the patient developed hemiplegia. And in the casual look, you might not see any significant problem. Uh, but if you repeat the CT scan sometime later, then you see the real problem. Now, here the same person, but the CT scan is done a day later, and you can very clearly see the abnormality here. Now, what is the abnormality to describe this abnormality? Uh, I think before that, you first have to orientate yourself. Uh, when you see a CT, it is as if you are looking into the mirror. So this would be actually the right side, although this is on your left, but this is actually the right side of the person. And this is the left side. So when we describe this opacity, this is on the left side. Since this patient had right-sided hemiplegia, so this left-sided lesion correlates with the right-sided hemiplegia. Now, uh, another point before I describe this opacity, two points that in radiology, there is a term used intensity. Now, intensity is actually the, the level of uh, resistance offered by a tissue to the radiation. Skull is very, uh, it is very, very intense, or you could say it, it casts a hyper intense shadow and because the, uh, the skull is radiopaque. Similarly, in this one, this is the core plexus. This is also very wide. So this will also be described as a hyper intense shadow. Uh, on the other end, this black shadow in the um, ventricles, this is the CSF. The black shadow is described as hypo intensity shadow. So knowing these two uh, extremes, the brain actually has intensity somewhere in the middle. This is the normal intensity of the brain. Whenever you describe some lesion in the brain, you give it a label of normal intensity, hyper intensity or hypo intensity. Now, of course, since this is black, more like CSF, so this would be described as hypo intensity shadow. So there is slightly ill-defined, but fairly well uh, demarcated uh, hypo intensity uh, shadow in the distribution of left uh, middle cerebral artery. And it is actually causing some edema also. How do I know it is causing edema? Because 
the ventricle on the left side is slightly compressed this is the normal size of the anterior horn of the ventricle now compared to this one this is slightly compressed now here also you can see the left sided uh, uh, ventricle is slightly compressed initially when there is infarction there is no increase in volume and there is also uh, the the infarcted part is not easily differentiable from the normal it has got the same intensity as the normal part only with time when uh, necrosis occurs when secondary changes occur when edema develops then you have this typical hyper intensity shadows so in the proper context this would be read as ischemic infarction with secondary edema in the distribution of left middle cerebral artery now if you go back to this ct scan and now you examine it again in some more detail and more carefully you would appreciate that this area is not exactly normal because you see here the the demarcation between white matter and gray matter is quite well defined here but this part has lost uh, the normal demarcation between gray matter and white matter so that should make you suspect that there may be some problem here particularly when you correlate with the history so uh, this is the ct scan which was done immediately but this looks normal for beginners i would like to emphasize one thing one might think that if the initial ct scan is likely to be normal then might as well wait for some time to do the scan that is not right because hemorrhagic stroke which is another type of stroke i'm going to show you some images that is shown uh, on the ct within minutes so we always do ct scan immediately if there is hemorrhage we already know the diagnosis so the further treatment is accordingly uh, optimized but if the initial ct scan does not show hemorrhage and clinically patient had hemiplegia then this would be read as uh, consistent with the diagnosis of left middle cerebral artery occlusion and some appropriate action may be taken maybe some other test is done uh, so and then if you want to do uh, you could also repeat the test uh, and when you repeat the test you might like to do it with contrast because contrast will go to the perfuse part of the brain and will not go to the uh, infarcted part so the demarcation between infarcted the part and the normal brain will be further highlighted so it will be diagnosis will become very very easy so this is a case of stroke you all know there are two major types of stroke hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke ischemic stroke will be seen in approximately 80 percent of the cases and rest would have other types of uh, strokes like hemorrhage uh, so this is uh, the commonest type i'm going to show you some more images of the ischemic stroke just uh, to have a revision how do you see this one and uh, this is very very obvious now you can see that there is hypo intensity shadow agreed and this is on the which side of the patient right side of the patient and this patient would probably have left sided hemiplegia and this is much bigger than the previous one and it is actually uh, i think the entire territory of uh, right middle cerebral artery so and this is not very fresh perhaps several days old this looks like now completely infarcted brain this wedge shaped area indicates that the middle cerebral artery from its origin is blocked and all you see is an infarcted part and again here you see some evidence of increased pressure you see the right sided ventricular system is compressed as compared to the left one here similarly here you don't actually see the posterior horn of the right ventricle uh, and this midline is also shifted whenever there is increased volume and midline shift you always suspect some space occupying lesion which usually refers to a brain tumor metastasis or hemorrhage uh, but in this case this lesion is very very typical this shape of that uh, lesion is very typical of infarction and shift of midline structure is because whenever infarction undergoes uh, degeneration necrosis it makes more protein molecules which are osmotically active they suck fluid uh, 
and then there is edema formation. In the initial scan, you will not see this shift of midline structure, but as infarction grows a little old, and especially if the infarction is big size, then you would see this second effects also. Uh, very much like the previous one, uh, it is also complete middle cerebral artery occlusion. Big, the shape is very typical of infarction with secondary changes, shift of midline structure. Very, very typical. Now, uh, when we compare CT scan with MRI, uh, generally speaking, MRI is considered to be better test because it has got better resolution. But in certain cases, CT scan may be better. The one main advantage of CT is that it is faster. It takes less time and it is more widely available and less expensive. Since in stroke, our uh, we need an, a diagnosis as quick as possible, so we prefer CT scan. This is the CT scan, and in this case, you see this part is in factor. It is not the entire um, left middle cerebrality, it is probably a branch of it. So this part, the parietal lobe, part of parietal lobe affecting maybe motor in sensory area, this is in factor. You can see it here. And in this case, there isn't much change in the volume because the ventricular system is not much distorted here. Same person, when you do uh, an MRI, uh, it looks like a different shape, but it is the same area. And this white lesion, this white lesion is the same as this one, and this is infarction. In the CT, in the uh, MRI, uh, if it is T1 Im weighted images, now this is a term you need to know, T1 weighted, T2 weighted. T1 weighted images are those where CSF is black. So this is the CSF, so this, since this is black, this is T1 weighted image. In T1 weighted images, infarction would look white, like hyper intensity shadow. So both are the same, but the looks are different because this is CT scan, this is MRI. This is uh, another type of uh, infarction called a lacunar infarction. Now, in this case, what happens is that those small end arteries which arise from the circular villus, they get occluded. This is a typical complication of uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, and they make, they, since these are end arteries, they do not have any further anastomosis. So once a small end artery is blocked, patient develops uh, hemiplegia or some other neurological deficit and the CT scan, you just see a small lacuna. This is a, a small lacuna. And see here even smaller. On MRI, you have this small rounded opacity, small hypointensity shadows. These are actually uh, lacunar infarctions. So lacunar infarction is also uh, uh, one of the types of infarction. They're relatively easy to miss. Uh, this is no comparison of uh, infarction with hemorrhage. This you have already seen. I showed you this in the previous X-ray, in the previous uh, slide. But compare this one uh, with this one. This is a very, very big, very hyper intense, irregular shadow, irregular opacity within the brain, uh, and it is very, very hyper intense. Now, unlike this one is affecting one entire territory of middle cerebral artery, right? This one, although is in the territory of middle cerebral artery, but it is not affecting the entire that part because this is actually a hematoma. Some branch of middle cerebral artery must have ruptured and there is accumulation of free blood in the brain parenchyma. Now, this part where I'm my, putting my cursors is actually hematoma. It has pushed brain to all the direction. Now, since brain a hemorrhage would, because of the sheer force, it will tear the brain and will find its place and that is why it is like irregular shape. But it is in the ter territory of uh, right middle cerebral artery. Some more points. Now, this is not the blood. This is not the blood. And this is blood. 
what is these things this is as blood present in the posterior horns of the lateral ventricle so that means so this big hemorrhage has actually also ruptured into the ventricles this hemorrhage has got ruptured into the ventricles and the blood has accumulated in the posterior horns why it has taken this shape because when ct scan is done patient is actually lying on the back on in his back and this becomes the most dependent part so in the dependent part you have blood which is little heavier than csf and in the part upper part you have black csf so this is free blood in the ventricular system this will not only reinforce a diagnosis of brain hemorrhage this will also uh, this might lead to secondary effects like it may block the drainage system of the brain and it might cause secondary hydrocephalus so this would be much more devastating uh, than this one this is likely to cause significant motor sensory disability but patient might survive this big hemorrhage because of the secondary effects because of the compression of the brain stem and broken of the drainage is much more likely uh, to kill the person so the mortality of this kind of stroke is much higher you also appreciate the increased volume you know this is a midline it has been pushed to the opposite side the the uh, left sided sorry the right sided uh, ventricular system is hardly visible it's a big hemorrhage a uh, hemorrhage usually occur this kind of hemorrhage usually occur in patients who have hypertension and hypertension is uncontrolled next let's see the next slide now now this is an old infarction what happens in old infarction is that this brain uh, tissue becomes liquefied uh, it is like very very Uh, liquid thing and you see the intensity of this part is equivalent to the intensity of csf so this is like fluid uh, and there is some gain of volume initially there is no change in volume then there is gain of volume here there is loss of volume sorry this is a loss of volume and that means that it is now providing more space for the ventricles to expand if you see the right sided ventricle it is bigger than the left side this is a normal one and this is expanded because this has pulled the structure to its own side and you can also see that the brain is shrunk and maybe this patient has some background cerebral atrophy also so this is an old infarction big one in the vicinity of a right middle cerebral artery uh this is again hemorrhage but this is different type this is hemorrhage and this is hemorrhage this may be the effect of brain contusion how do i know this is brain contusion because you see this is the scar if you compare with this one there is lot of edema and swelling in the scar on the both side this patient probably got a road traffic injury or some other kind of injury and uh, this is actually contusion contusion will create both types of effect it would cause the effect of uh, ischemia uh, and also the effect of hemorrhage so this is these white shadows are perhaps hemorrhages in this contused lung ischemia uh, ischemic cva ct versus mri i have shown this earlier also but just for the vision this is a infarction i think several days old and this is another infarction in fact the same patient but slice taken at another level these two are uh, infarctions on ct scan these two are also infarction but this is mri on mri you get and if the csf is black t1 weighted images then you get infarction shown as white uh, opacity so these are infarction these are not tumors because if there were tumors uh, then they would have taken much more space and it would have caused much more increase in the volume and this ventricular system uh, would have much more distorted and if you correlate with the history uh, this patient had sudden onset neurological deficit so this is somewhat in front 
uh, it might not have affected the motor part or it could have affected just the speech and the frontal lobe frontal lobe has it got its own neurological features so this is how do you compare ct scan and mri uh, now that we have seen some cases of uh, uh, ischemic infarction and uh, hemorrhages so let's uh, sum up the findings csf finding ct findings of brain infarction initially normal or subtle changes subtle changes would be loss of demarcation between uh, gray matter and white matter but slightly later you have hypo intensity area corresponding to the affected artery whichever artery is occluded you would have this hypo intensity shadow in that part then later on once this ischemic brain undergoes necrosis there is volume gain and you will then have a compression of the neighboring ventricles or also shift of midline structure but not to the extent we expect in brain tumors in SOLs further hypo intensity and volume loss later on if the infarction is big one and becomes very very old it becomes liquefied and then you will see that it becomes so hypo intense that it would look like a ventricular fluid and there is loss of volume that means it will pull the neighboring structure and sometimes you can see thrombus in artery that is not a usual finding but in some cases you can see a thrombus in the artery that will confirm that there is actually ischemia and this could be thrombus or embolus but that can be sometimes seen and that would provide the opportunity for thrombectomy uh, or thrombolysis. Uh, let's now see the hemorrhage. I've shown you one image of hemorrhage just for the comparison, but this is again brain hemorrhage. Uh, these two images are of the same person. This is two hours after onset. This is 6.5 hours uh, after the onset. The only difference is that this has grown in size and number two, the blood has gone into the ventricles also. Here this is, this is described as a large, hyper intense, irregular shape, uh, opacity in the right uh, parietal lobe. This is the typical location of brain hemorrhage. This is the main hemorrhage but you also have small hemorrhages here also, this one this is a core plexus this is not hemorrhage and these are also core plexus this is the lateral ventricles this is the uh, third ventricle these are core plexus they are typically very hyper intense because they are not dependent they are hanging from the roof so these are core plexus but here in, in addition to these you have these two uh, hemorrhages very typical of blood in the posterior horns of the ventricles uh, how do you know this is blood because it wasn't present here and number two it has got classical upper flat level because blood being heavier than csf would take the most dependent part and the upper part is occupied by the csf with the flat, flat border this means that this hemorrhage must have ruptured uh, it into the ventricles also so it has the some fluid has gone into the ventricle as I said earlier, this fluid is going to cause further increase in uh, raised endocrine pressure. It is going to cause hydrocephalus and it is going to add to mortality. So this patient might need evacuation. There are some specific indications of evacuation. If there is a big hematoma close to the uh, skull, and this one actually is very close to the effect, and there are secondary effects, there could be a case for evacuation. And a hematoma in the posterior fossa is also another indication. Of course, this is beyond my scope, uh, but you must take, if there is a big hematoma, you must take advice of neurosurgeon, and uh, that neurosurgeon will decide if this is the right case of the right case for uh, evacuation. So the three conditions uh, which need to be fulfilled: number one, it has to be early; number two, it has to be superficial.
Number three, especially if it is large and is in the posterior fossa. These are the typical indication of drainage. Of course, you will never give thrombolytic agent aspirin clopidogrel to these patients. Another hematoma, this is rather central. Uh, it is perhaps in the cerebellum. This is the cerebellum. Uh, it could be the cerebrum, also occipital lobe. But since it is, this is the petrous part of the uh, uh, temporal bones. So this is probably uh, posterior fossa cerebellum and there is a big hemorrhage here. And this rounded hyper intensity shadow is surrounded by gray layer of the brain. This is showing brain edema. Whenever there is expanding lesion in the brain like hematoma, the neighboring brain gets compressed and also uh, changes its shape, hypo intensity shadow. Uh, another patient with the posterior fossa hemorrhage and you can see this is a big hemorrhage, oval shaped hemorrhage and again there is surrounding edema. This is bone, these are the bone structures and this is air. Uh, again hemorrhage but this time the hemorrhage is probably into the ventricular system. Because you know, brain appears to be okay. Uh, this part of the brain, this part, this part looks like normal. Only the ventricular system, this is the body, the anterior horn and the posterior horn. The ventricular system on both sides has turned into uh, the blood cast. So this is intraventricular hemorrhage. This would surely cause increased pressure and secondary effects. And my guess is that this would this patient would benefit from uh, drainage. Now let's now sum up features of hypertensive hemorrhage. Ha hemorrhage can be due to many uh, other situations. I'm going to show you some images. But hypertension, especially uncontrolled hypertension, remains the most important uh, cause of brain hemorrhage. The location is usually basal ganglia or internal capsule or pons or cerebellum. Of course, it can be elsewhere, but these are the typical sites of uh, hemorrhage due to uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, mostly, I showed you uh, the hemorrhages uh, in, in internal capsule and the basal ganglia and also the cerebellum. Patient is usually hypertensive before intracranial hemorrhage occurs. Now this point I'm emphasizing, emphasize, emphasizing because patient with acute ischemic stroke also is likely to develop secondary hypertension. So if at the time of presentation, blood pressure recordings are slightly high, that does not mean that this patient has got hemorrhagic stroke. In fact, even in hypertensive population, the common stroke is ischemic stroke. So if somebody has hypertension before uh, this event happened and hypertension is uncontrolled, that would favor the possibility of intracranial hemorrhage. Lo localize, localizing symptoms and signs, of course, all neurological uh, lesions, they cause this. Uh, but there would be additional symptoms also because uh, there is a raised intracranial pressure. When hematoma expands, it tears the brain, it might lead to seizures and it may also cause altered state of consciousness. Patient may be drowsy, may be confused, may be stuporous or may be frankly comatose, depending upon the degree of raised intracranial pressure. And if there is a hematoma, it will push the brain uh, and the brain stem may get herniated into the uh, foramen meganim and that, that could cause uh, the breathing abnormalities. That makes the case very serious. Breathing abnormalities means that patient is not able to breathe. Uh, normally patient may have chain stroke breathing, patient may have wires breathing, patient may have apneic spells. So these kind of abnormalities you normally see in patient with intracranial hemorrhage, large hemorrhages as compared to uh, infarction. Although a very big infarction can also produce similar symptoms, but generally speaking, infarction causes localizing symptoms and patient may remain awake and conscious, but there is neurological deficit, motor or sensory 
or whichever part of the brain is affected. In hemorrhage, patient tends to lose consciousness if it is large and patient tends to have uh, seizures and breathing irregularly and the overall mortality of acute hemorrhage is much more than acute ischemic stroke. And uh, prognosis is generally bad in cases of hemorrhage. Now, I'll just take this opportunity to uh, explain one thing that prognosis is not always bad if there is a patient with small hematoma and if that patient survives acute phase in fact long-term prognosis may be better if you have same size uh, infarction uh, compared to infarction the same size patient is more likely to recover completely without leaving behind any neurological deficit because once hematoma is absorbed the neighboring brain which was just compressed it takes its position again and then uh, the neurological function is restored. But big hematomas, they have very high mortality. Evacuation in some selected cases is also recommended. Uh, this is uh, another type of hemorrhage and uh, it is rather diffuse, you see. This is the actually base of the skull. This is the base of the skull. You can see this white hyper intensive shadow on both sides. It is as if there is some free blood in the uh, in the CSF space below the brain. That is actually the case. This is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage occur in those patients who have arteriovenous malformations or um, uh, berry aneurysm these are congenital lesions before they rupture the patient may be absolutely asymptomatic no problem at all but one moment there is sudden headache thunderclap type of headache sudden onset of headache and that is followed by unconsciousness because any moment that weak part of the aneurysm might rupture and then the because the arteries have high pressure and the blood spreads in the entire CSF causing brain this meningeal irritation causing blockade of the drainage system causing secondary vasospasm and sometimes re-bleed and this is actually the typical picture of bleeding this is subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, you can see that the blood is present all over uh, on both sides same here subarachnoid hemorrhage you need of course history to interpret this ct better the same person uh, if you cut the section in the upper part that was the base but this is the upper part you still see some some blood in the fissures in the cell side but what impresses uh, me here is that the, there are no cell side and gyri this is because of increased pressure because the drainage system is not completely blocked the brain is swollen brain is compressed it is compressed against the, uh, the skull causing this uh, diffuse granular uh, uh, shadow you don't see you don't appreciate uh, cell size and gyri you don't appreciate various structure within the brain it is just one big gray lesion this is the effect of uh, hydrocephalus I mean you don't see the ventricle but the brain edema actually brain is in depression now features of subarachnoid hemorrhage previously asymptomatic maybe mild headaches most patients with the subarachnoid hemorrhage they are young people and young people because this is the congenital lesion of course it could bleed in the late age also but since it is congenital it usually bleeds in an age where there is no reason to have another cause of bleeding. Patient may be relatively young, no uh, hypertension, no risk factors for ischemic stroke, and just one moment they develop this severe kind of stroke uh, because there was a congenital abnormality in the vessel. There may not be any precipitating factor. There may be some trauma or some jolt, but I think mostly uh, it just happens. Uh, some patient would give history of some mild headaches in the past also but uh, usually since headache is extremely common condition uh, 
the previous attacks of headaches are usually uh, treated as just headache until this major bleed occurs. Sudden headache followed by altered state of consciousness progressing to coma. Signs of meningeal irritation like kerning sign will be positive, neck stiffness will be positive, and Brunzewski's neck flexion and leg flexion ties would be positive, just like we see in meningitis. Investigation of choice is CT scan, not lumbar puncture. Uh, why I'm saying so? Because in in meningitis, we always go for lumbar puncture. Although even in meningitis, the first line investigation is CT. But after CT, we do plan LP also because the diagnosis of uh, meningitis is never complete without CSF examination. In 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 uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, just CT scan is good enough. Major complication: the re-bleed and vasospasm. Uh, I will of course not go into the detail. Then uh, magnetic resonance angiography or digital subtraction angiography may be done within 24 hours or after two hours to to uh, to determine the presence of those congenital abnormalities and they should be then treated. Clipping or surgery of aneurysm is the treatment of choice, and the aim is that this thing should not happen again. So we have done with the intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now there is another type of hemorrhage in the brain uh, surroundings. I think before we uh, discuss those, I just want to refresh your knowledge about the meninges. This is the dura mater. Uh, this is of course skull. This is the scalp and skull, and this is the dura mater. Thick, tough structure. This one is dura mater. This is arachnoid yellow and this is pyometer which is the outer covering of the brain this is the brain now you have taken the section from here uh, now there are two types of hemorrhages which can occur uh, around the brain uh, one is extra dural now you see that this is the dura mater this green thick tough structure is the dura mater and bleeding outside this dura mater is called extra dural hematoma now this is usually a complication of skull injury as shown here. This is the fracture of the skull and this blood is usually, it, it comes from the uh, middle meningeal artery. So extra dural hematoma occurs in the setting of head injury and the source of blood is meningeal artery. Now, as compared to this one, this is another type of hematoma. This is subdural. You see, this is the dura. Dura is very strongly adherent uh, to the uh, skull, but this is hemorrhage which is between dura and uh, arachnoid matter. Uh, so the source of this blood is veins. As you see, the color coding red is arterial, uh, the uh, blue is venous. So this is the venous blood. This typically occurs in the setting of an elderly person with the trivial brain trauma. Now, this is very strange. Somebody who is not young, elderly person uh, comes with progressive deterioration in the brain function over a period of maybe days. And there may not be any history. The onset is not sure because the onset is very subtle. No history of injury uh, to the head, significant injury. But when you ask in detail, then patient will tell that there was trivial uh, injury like patient had a little fall in the house or had got struck against something so trivial injury uh, with this background I'm going to show you the images now this is extra dural extra dural hematoma is likely to be smaller because for blood to accumulate it has to uh, uh, tear off the adherent dura mater from the bone and that leads a lot of force and this blood is arterial and this is because of the fracture and you can see the fracture here and you can see scalp edema and this this takes the shape of uh, a, a lens or you could say bioconvex uh, opacity or uh, lemon shape I'll show you why do you call it lemon shape now this is sub uh, dural 
how do we say this is subdural because this is much bigger and the interlining is irregular because this is actually uh, arachnoid matter this is dura matter dura matter is much tough and it has got this shape and subarachnoid uh, uh, this is the uh, the the arachnoid matter is much softer just like paper it is lifted easily uh, and then hematoma takes this shape irregular shape and it is much bigger in size and more like a crescent or banana shape there is evidence of raised pressure in both sides this is the midline shift mid this is the midline and it is shifted to the opposite side in this also this is the midline and it is shifted you can see this part of the brain is also somewhat affected you don't see this side at ventricle because that is compressed another case of extra dural hematoma again ventricles are compressed another case of extra dural hematoma these hematomas they appear uh, white now diagnosis of extra dural hematoma is usually made early because there is a history of head trauma whenever there is a history of head trauma we do usually do x-rays and ct scan so that is why extra dural hematoma are usually diagnosed early as compared to subdural hematoma which may remain undiagnosed for several days now this is an image with both type of hemorrhages this is extra dural and this is bioconvex and this resembles the lemon and this is a, a subdural hematoma much longer and with slightly irregular internal lines more like crescent or banana so this is how you compare both uh, sometime the differential may be difficult but mostly especially if you know the context uh, i think the diagnosis is relatively easy now another type of hemorrhage we are now getting uh, close to the end uh, this is i believe a subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, subdural hemat hematomas but this one is different now what do you say is this infarction this big thing or is this hemorrhage this hyper intensity shadow is actually hemorrhage would you say that this is hemorrhage with the surrounding edema i don't really think so because then there is the edema is out of proportion this is most primarily this is most likely a primary ischemic stroke this is a large ischemic stroke and this is due to uh, uh, this is due to uh, occlusion of middle cerebral artery so once there is ischemic necrosis the brain dies and the blood vessels also undergo necrosis and then there is secondary rupture of blood vessel so this is actually the secondary hemorrhage this is hemorrhage but secondary primarily this patient has got ischemic stroke but there is secondary hemorrhage so that was all i hope i have given you reasonably good account of various presentations of stroke uh i have shown you intracerebral hemorrhages i have shown you infarction i have shown you subarachnoid hemorrhage i have shown you subdural hematoma i have shown you extra dural hematoma and i have shown you a hematoma which after second you can function so this completes our module on uh the role of ct scan or mri in acute stroke uh, this has been professor azizur rahman from medstan and i look forward to see you in my next lecture on miscellaneous diseases on ct scan thank you